Hi, this is Mrs. Olson, and I'm going to read to you from the episode entitled The Cattle of the Sun God from the Odyssey. This begins on page 980 in our textbook. In the small hours of the third watch, when stars that shone out in the first dusk of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven and clouds driven by Zeus, shrouded land and sea in a night of storm. So just as dawn with fingertips of rose touched the windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto, a sea cave where nymphs had chairs of rock and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, old shipmates, our stores are in the ship's hold, food and drink. The cattle here are not for our provision or we pay dearly for it. Fierce the god is who cherishes these heifers and these sheep, Helios, and no man avoids his eye. To this my fighters nodded, yes, but now we had a month of onshore gales blowing day in, day out, south winds or south by east, as long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up and appease their craving, they would not touch the cattle. But in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, Hunger drove them to scour the wild shore with angling hooks for fishes and sea fowl, whatever fell into their hands, and lean days wore their bellies thin. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there and made supplication to the gods who own Olympus, all the gods, but they, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. Now on the shore, Eurylochus made his insidious plea. Comrades, he said, you've gone through everything. Listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us mortal wretches, but famine is the most pitiful. The worst end that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come, we'll cut out the noblest of these cattle for sacrifice to the gods who own the sky. And once at home in the old country of Ithaca, if ever that day comes, we'll build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the Lord of Noon. But if he flares up over his heifers lost, wishing our ship destroyed, and if the gods make cause with him, why then I say... Better open your lungs to a big sea once for all than waste to skin and bones on a lonely island. Thus Eurylochus, and they murmured, I, trooping away at once to round up heifers. Now that day tranquil cattle with broad brows were grazing, were gazing near, and soon the men drew, uh, drew up around their chosen beasts in ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on a tall oak, having no barley meal to strew the victims, performed the prayers and ritual, knifed the kine, and flayed each carcass, cutting thigh bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings, with strips of meat, were laid upon the fire then, as they had no wine. They made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first, and when the bones were burnt and tripes shared, they spitted the carved meat. Just then, my slumber left me in a rush. My eyes opened, and I went down the seaward path. No sooner had I caught sight of our black hole than savory odors of burnt fat eddied around me. Grief took hold of me, and I cried aloud, O oh, Father Zeus and gods and bliss forever! You made me sleep away this day of mischief. O oh, cruel, drowsing in the evil hour! Here they sat in a great work they contrived. Lampatia, in her long gown, meanwhile, had borne swift word to the overlord of noon. Here's a map uh, of, of the events in the Odyssey. Just kind of nice to see where some of the locations are. You can see that. And they're right in the middle on Sicily is where Thrinacia is. So that's the island that they're on right now. Okay, so Lampatia is uh, going up to Olympus. They have killed your kind. And the Lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the immortals. 
O Father Zeus and gods and bliss forever, punish Odysseus's men. So overweening now they have killed my peaceful kind, my joy at morning when I climbed the sky of stars, and evening when I bore westward from heaven. Restitution or penalty they shall pay, and pay in full, or I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. Then Zeus, who drives the storm cloud, made reply, Peace, Erios. Shine on among the gods, shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white-hot bolt and make splinters of their ship in the wine-dark sea. Calypso later told me of this exchange, as she declared that Hermes had told her. Well, when I reached the sea cave and the ship, I faced each man and had it out. But where could any remedy be found? There was none. The silken beeves of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made queer signs appear. Cowhides began to crawl, and beef, both raw and roasted, lowed like kine upon the spits. Now six full days my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef they had marked for slaughter from Helios's herd, and Zeus, the son of Cronus, added one more fine morning. All the gales had ceased, blown out, and with an offshore breeze we launched again, stepping the mast and sail to make for the open sea. Astern of us the island coastline faded, and no land showed anywhere but only sea and heaven. When Zeus Cronion piled a thunderhead above the ship while gloom spread on the ocean, we held our course but briefly. Then the squall struck, whining from the west with gale force breaking both force days, and the mast came toppling aft along the ship's length, so the running rigging showered into the bilge. On the after deck, the mast had hit the steersman a slant blow, bashing the skull in, knocking him overside as the brave soul fled the body, like a diver, with crank on crank, oh, excuse me, with crack on crack of thunder. Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, a direct hit so that she bucked in reeking fumes of sulfur, and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the wreck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. No more seafaring homeward for these, no sweet day of return. The god had turned his face from them. I clambered fore and aft my hulk until a, a comber split her, kill from ribs, and the big timber floated free. The mast, too, broke away. A backstay floated dangling from it, a stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing mast and keel together. These I straddled, riding the frightful storm. Nor had I yet seen the worst of it, for now the west wind dropped and a southeast gale came on, one more twist of the knife, taking me north again, straight for Charybdis. All that night I drifted, and in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay off Scylla Mountain and Charybdis Deep. There, as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great fig tree, catching on like a bat under a bough. Nowhere had I to stand, no way of climbing the root and bowl, being far below and far above my head, the branches and their leaves massed, overshadowing Charybdis pool. But I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted, and ah, how with what desire I waited, how long with what desire I waited, till at the twilight hour, when one who hears and judges pleas in the marketplace all day between contentious men goes home to supper, the long poles at last reared from the sea. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled astride and rode hard with my hands to pass by Scylla. Never could I have passed her had not the father of gods and men this time kept me from her eyes. Once through the strait, nine days I drifted in the open sea before I made shore, buoyed up by the gods. Upon uh, Ojagia Isle, the dangerous nymph, Calyps nymph Calypso lives there and sings there in her beauty. And she received me, loved me. But why tell you the same tale that I told you last night in Hall to you and to your lady? Those adventures made a long evening, and I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story. And there's a picture of Odysseus's boat and his men on his boat before it was destroyed.